Down Dead Arcades. This video is about the Battle of Glen Morrison, which is recorded as being fought in 638 AD by one of the kings of Dalriada, Domhnall Brick. There's a little bit of a primer before we get started. There are some things we're going to come across here which are quite obscure. Dalriada at this time is a kingdom in the 7th century that is basically commensurate with modern day Argyll. It is made up of lots of different regions called Kennels, Kennela, which are basically very early kind of proto versions of clans. Now two of these kennels, Gabran, which is based mostly in modern day Kintyre, and Cowl, which is modern day Cowl, make up together a group called the Corcureti. Now these two together seem to become the most powerful and at times dominated the rest of Dalriada. So we're going to talk a lot about them as the video goes along. The history of the early medieval period, spanning from around 400 AD with the Roman retreat from Britain to the middle 11th century and the arrival of the Normans, is fragmentary and can often be difficult to reconstruct. Understanding the people and the events of this period involves piecing together shreds of written evidence from various sources and matching them with available archaeology to build a picture of what happened. For in the mid 7th century, little is known of the Battle of Glen Morrison, and on face value, it seems a shadowy event to pin down and understand today. The surviving evidence seems slight. It is a scrap of information that gives us very little, but hints at much, much more. The Battle of Glen Morrison is recorded in two of our surviving early sources which cover this period. The Annals of Ulster record it simply that in January 638 they recorded the Bellum Glen Morrison, or the Battle of Glen Morrison. For the same date, the Annals of Tigernach record a slightly different version in a mixture of Gaelic and Latin, that they record the Battle of Glen Morrison in which Domhnall Brick's men fled. There is no Glen Morrison in Scotland today, and the location of the battle has defied identification by antiquarians and historians alike. This video will examine the evidence to argue that the battle was in fact a key event in the rise of a new political power in 7th century Northern Britain, and that the lost Glen Morrison, scene of Donald Brick's defeat, can be found in the modern day Cowell Peninsula. After establishing the evidence for the battle taking place in Cowell, the video is going to look at the reasons which brought Donald Brick and his army there before exploring two potential sites for the battlefield. We'll round off by discussing what the experience of battle may have been like before looking at the wider consequences which Donald Brick's defeat had on the balance of power in 7th century Northern Britain. Domhnall Brick was a king of Dalriada in the mid 7th century. Born into the royal line of Gibran, the kings of Kintyre, he inherited a kingdom which had peaked under his grandfather Aidan three decades before. At its height, this encompassed the Scots scales of Dalriada and it dominated northern Britain. But by 631 in the coronation of Donal Brick, Dalriada's star was on the wane and its new king would prove ill-equipped to halt that decline. We know of no battles that Donal Brick participated in that he did not lose. It's an unfortunate epitaph, but he can be called Scotland's first bad king. One of the clashes that broke Donal Brick's power was the Battle of Glen Morrison in January 638. For years, historians have struggled to identify its location. This video will analyse the evidence to argue that the fatal battle took place in modern Cowell. According to the Annals of Ulster, Domhnall Brick was defeated in 638 at the Battle of Morrison. The count doesn't tell us who defeated him, just that he was defeated in a battle. His defeat is corroborated by Adomnan's Life of Columba, in which we have an account from an Ionan abbot, Kumeni Find, lamenting that the Kennel Gibran power was put down by extranei, or outsiders, in 637. But who were these outsiders? The extranei in question are unlikely to be King Eugene Mapbelli's Altclut Britons from Dumbarton Rock, who finally defeated and killed Donald Breck at the Battle of Strathcairn in 643. The historian James Fraser instead argues that they're just likely to be the ones who administered the coup de grace to an already defeated king. So we have to look elsewhere for Domhnall Brick's enemy. In 637 at the Battle of Magroth in Ireland, the Irish Annals account that Domhnall Brick and Kennel Gabran were catastrophically beaten by the Kennel Connell when fighting alongside the Dalnaridi, which seems to have broken their power in the immediate aftermath. It's important to remember that in the 7th century, the Irish Sea was not the barrier we may think of it as now. 
The kings of Dalriada had territorial interests and were active on either side of the Irish Sea as they fought to extend their power. Another piece of evidence which can be found is in the Welsh poem The Godothan, an epic tragedy and a very early tale of a host of warriors who rode out from Dunedin, or Edinburgh, the capital of the kingdom of Godothan, to attack the Anglo-Saxon invaders to the south at Catraith, believed to be modern-day Catrick in northern Yorkshire. The warband were killed almost to a man, but interestingly for us, there's an extra verse added later to the poem called the Strath Caron Stanza. It tells of Donald Breck's defeat and death at the Battle of Strath Caron in 643, and it names him as the Lord of Kintyre, not Dalriada. Clearly, something has happened to Donald Breck's status in between his succession to the throne in 631 and his death in battle in 643. Now, the Irish Chronicles record that within a year of the defeat at Magroth, Domhnall Breck was defeated again and put to flight by Extranii in the battle of the unidentified Glen Morrison. Iona and its abbots had aligned themselves not with the whole of what we think of as Dalriada, that is the Gales of Western Scotland, roughly contemporary with modern Argyll, but instead they'd aligned themselves with one of the royal households, the line of Kenel Gabran and Kintyre. To Iona and its chronicles, any political players outside of their friends in Kenel Gabran could be considered extraneous, not just the Picts or the Northern Britons with their foreign tongues. Now, the Irish chronicles are believed to rely on a lost chronicle from Iona as their own source material, so our surviving sources contain a very Iona centric bias which we must be aware of. With that in mind, the likeliest candidate for the extraneous to have defeated Donald Breck at Morrison is Ferker MacConaid, the dynastic leader of the Kennel Cowl, whom the Annals list is reigning from 637 to 650. This means that although Donald Breck lived for another five years after Morrison, Ferker had taken primacy from him as king of the Corcureti and leader of the Scots Gales of Southern Dalriada. Ferker was an extraneous to Kennel Gabran as his father, Conard Kerr, was grandson of Conal MacDomingart Retty, founder of the neighbouring Kennel Cow. The timing of the Battle of Glen Muirson is unusual. The Annals of Tigernach and of Ulster both record that it took place in January 638. This is well out of the normal campaigning season and a difficult time of year to supply any army on the move. This too points to a close target for Donald Brick to strike. He wouldn't want to ride far. Cow would have been an opportune, accessible and obvious target for a force riding out from neighbouring Kintyre. Therefore, the evidence in the surviving sources identifying Kennel Cow as a usurping dynastic rival who produced a king to replace Donald Breck on the throne of Corcureti matches with the circumstantial evidence of the unusual timing of the battle and the campaign that must have led up to it. Although not explicitly named by the entry for the battle in the Irish Chronicles, arguably Kennel Cow are identified by the surrounding information as the most likely enemy for Donald Breck to have faced on the battlefield in January 638. Although defeated at Glen Muirson, Donald Breck survived to lead the Kennel Gabran army into battle again in 643, as we also have no surviving record of him being taken prisoner or sent into exile after his defeat at Glen Muirson, the evidence points to the battle being fought as a result of Donald Breck leading an invasion into the lands of Kennel Cow in an attempt to regain his throne and power over the Corcureti. When he was defeated, he must have been able to retreat back to the safety of his own lands and stronghold in Kintyre. Subsequently, we come to the logical conclusion that Glen Morrison is to be found somewhere in modern-day Cow. Wider events suggest the alliance between the Altclute Britons of Dumbarton and their Kennel Cowl neighbours existed in the 630s. The alliance is seen as a reason why the Clydesdale Britons alone of the Northern Britonic Kingdom survived the ravages of the rising power and assaults of the Bernician Angles in the 7th century. 
Reliance also seems to have pulled down the pits from the 670s. Now this hints at a joint alliance in the north of Britain versus the rising power of the Angles of Bernicia in wider Northumbria. The Iona Chronicle keeps track of several strands of the Kenilgabran dynasty at this time, but it says nothing of Kenilcurl. Added to this, Segeni, the abbot of Iona from 623 to 652, pursued a policy of outreach and missionary work with the Angles of Bernicia, who seemed to be the enemies of Kenilcurl and the Britonic allies. The lack of information recorded on Kenilcurl shows Iona was not favourable to them, and he would have spun a historic account of events against them. When Adomnan, the abbot of Iona from 679 to 704, called the Bernician ruler Oswald King of All Britain in the opening chapter of his Life of Columba, he is laying down Iona's and probably Colonel Gabran's political position. Most likely this wasn't Colonel Carroll and Alan Clutes. Two large political groups are clearly emerging in northern Britain. Iona, with the Colonel Gabran kings of Kintyre, allied to the rising might of the Angles of Northumbria, against Kennel Cowell and the Britons of Alclute, later joined by the Picts. The Battle of Glen Murison is a key marker for the beginnings of these great alliances in action. In 7th century Northern Britain, the prestigious abbots of Iona had become kingmakers in their own right, demanding obeisance before them in St Columba before agreeing on the fitness of kings to rule. Kennel Cowell and the Britons may have been overlooked and regarded as extranei, as their attention was directed to their own rival centre of Christianity at King Garth on Butte. A reference in the Sentius Fern Alban, a 10th century census of Dalriada, suggests that Kennel Cowell held Butte in the 7th and 8th centuries, and it makes sense that the rulers of Cowell looked to a monastic centre within their own lands for spiritual guidance rather than the more distant partisan Iona. Material evidence from St Blaine's and King Garth shows that it was an early Christian centre active from the end of the 6th century, bringing literacy and learning to the Clyde. In terms of politics, influence and prestige, the monks of King Garth were certainly rivals of the monastic centre Iona. An alliance between Kennel Cowell and the Britons of Alt tied together through mutual religious focus on the bishops of King Garth, could also explain a porous frontier between the two. A friendly one in which armies rose and possibly worked together to ambush foes such as, potentially, Domhnall Breck at Glen Morrison. This has a direct bearing on investigating Domhnall Breck's defeat at Glen Morrison as Kennel Cow was far more likely to fight with the assurance of backing from their neighbours. As we shall see, the close proximity of the argued site of the battle to the frontier between Kennel Cow and the Britons means that there is also a strong chance that the Britons played a part in the battle. Domhnall Breck is recorded as being an unsuccessful king on the battlefield. In his 12 year reign he is never recorded as winning one single battle. Why then did his retinue stick with him for the duration of his reign? To have survived as long as he did, Domhnall Breck must have offered something to his followers. The answer may lie in raiding. Raiding was an endemic thing to early medieval politics and society, and it was a key means for early medieval kings to retain the loyalty of their followers through the distribution of the proceeds. To retain his crown, it is possible that Domhnall Breck was a serial raider. After his defeat in Ireland the previous summer, and his subsequent usurpation by the head of Kennel Cow, the Glen Morrison battle may have been a surprise winter cattle raid into newly hostile Cowell territory that ended up going wrong. The target of such a raid would have been cattle. There is great significance to cattle in the early medieval period, especially as an object of tribute which had the overriding advantage that it delivered itself to the point of consumption. A survey of animal bone remains from the excavation of the Dalriadan Royal Centre at Denali by Oban shows that 64% of the bone excavated were from cattle. Although information is almost non-existent for Northern Britain, in Ireland at the time cattle were kept for dairying, producing a diet of milk, butter, cheese and curds. Immature males were slaughtered so the majority of the head were cows. As well as food, calves were being slaughtered for the hides to make vellum for the monks' books. The humble cow was a general purpose asset to early medieval society. The major social importance of cattle, however, was as an objective for cattle raids. These were the leading adventure sport and training grounds for warfare. In Ireland, the more head of cattle a lord had, the wealthier and more prestigious he was. 
The historian Leslie Alcock thinks it is more than reasonable to extrapolate this to the peoples across northern Britain. Marauding expeditions into other countries were an important function of the Tilu, or the royal bodyguard. Although attested to amongst the Angling kingdoms, there appears to be no explicit evidence for royal bodyguards amongst the Picts and Dalriada. It is impossible, however, to believe that they didn't exist. Kings initiated wars, along with the annual trans-border raids or hostings, and they seized booty. That was the behaviour expected of them. Warriors for the royal household would have had the opportunity to make a reputation for themselves and would have also received a share of the booty after the raid. In this way, the king bound his supporters to him by sharing wealth and prestige, which in turn would attract more warriors, expanding his army and generating more prestige in turn for the king. Raiding therefore formed an intrinsic part in the fabric of early medieval society. In the late 6th century, the poor Urbjan composed a poem celebrating a raid by King Urien of Reged against the Britonic kingdom of Manau, which was situated in the upper Forth Valley. They saw him plunder 160 cattle. Cattle changing hands was important to the society. The Bernician palace at Yevering Bell in Cheviots had a palisaded enclosure of three quarters of a hectare, with one ten times that size just downriver at Millfield. These are corrals for gathering cattle as tribute. The historian James Fraser talks about the importance of vassal kings paying their tribute in cattle, probably the main form of tribute in 7th century Northern Britain. He suggests that having presumably extended his protection to Iona, round about 640, King Oswald of Northumbria may have done the same for Kenon and Gobran around this time, especially if Donald Brick was struggling. The Battle of Glen Murison could be argued to have been caused by Donald Brick raiding into Cowell to seize cattle for tribute to honour his new overlord. One useful outcome of the annual cattle raid was that it provided battle training and more importantly battle experience for new recruits, who were probably no more than 14 or 15 years old. No doubt the pursuit of hunting would have given them some training in horsemanship and, so far as weapon handling was concerned, in spear throwing as well. But far more necessary was the battle hardening of both men and horses against the sights, sounds and smells of battle. The harsh challenges of the enemy, the whinnying and screams of wounded animals and men, and the smell of blood and ordure. After his losses at Calathros and Lorne, and then the disaster at Magroth in Ireland, Donald Breck would have needed to replenish his war band with fresh blood. A raid into Kenokau or over the frontier into the lands of the Alkloot Britons makes sense as a means to blood his new recruits. This may also have been a factor in his defeat. Was Donald Breck's band inexperienced and therefore vulnerable to Kennel Cow? Donald Breck is remembered by the Chronicles of History as losing every battle in which he led, to the serious detriment of the fortunes of his kingdom. If this alone was all he achieved, then surely Donald Breck's supporters would have fallen away and removed him long before his reign eventually came to an end in 643. I would argue that Donald Breck must have had a way of keeping the faith of those who supported him and raiding offers the most obvious answer. If Donald Breck had led regular raids throughout his reign, he would presumably have gathered the resources necessary to dish out the treasure necessary to keep the loyalty of his nobles and warriors of the royal household. So as it can be seen, the reasons for raiding being the cause of the Battle of Glen Morrison are numerous and persuasive, but what else could have been the cause behind the battle? Donald Breck may have been raiding to seize noble or royal captives. Hostage taking had important implications for a king's prestige and for his ability to control or at least influence relations with his neighbours. As for prestige, the Irish laws asserted that he is not a king who does not have hostages in fetters. The Picts followed this custom too, with accounts of their overking, Angus, taking two of his rival Selbach's sons and putting them into shackles. With its fertile valleys, it is more than likely that noble members or even princes of the Kennel Cow lived in the Nether Cow region rather than solely at the royal seat of King Garth on Butte, and these men may have been the target for Donald Brick's raid in January 638. Hostage taking was a powerful means of ensuring the payment of tribute from neighbours, either reluctant to acknowledge overlordship or rebellious against it. Not towing the line would prove costly for the hostages and their kin, as the historian Fergus Kelly records that in Ireland, if the authority of the overking was flouted, the hostages were forfeit and they might be killed, blinded or ransomed. 
The taking of hostages might also be a means of guaranteeing the neutrality of one neighbour as a prelude to a major campaign against another. The historian Bede recorded that the Northumbrian king Edgefrith raided Ireland in 684 and returned with prisoners. These may have been hostages for Irish neutrality in Edgefrith's 685 campaign against the Picts, which ended with the famous battle at Nechtensmere. With their viable tracts of arable land, Glenderul and Strath Echig would have been home to a relatively important strata of nobles. These would have been worthy targets for Donald Breck, along with the cattle his retinue would no doubt have rustled on the occasion. However, there is evidence against a raid leading to the Battle of Glenmuirson. The Irish and Welsh annals take no account of these annual hostings and they record only major battles, especially those in which potentates were killed. Therefore, either the Battle of Glenmuirson was a hosting that went wrong and Donald Breck was caught, resulting in a battle, or Donald Breck was up to something else. Otherwise, the raid would never have appeared in our chronicles. Right in the early 8th century, the historian Bede records several examples of the Anglian kings of Northumbria and their various enemies making war to lay waste to enemy lands. However, he can't be fully relied upon due to a lack of corroborating evidence. The aim of such invasions seems to have been to kill an enemy king and lay waste to land and communities. The victims described seem to bounce back quickly, however. Donald Breck may have ridden against Kill to hamstring his dynastic rivals by destroying their settlements and lands. In the depths of winter there would be no crops to destroy, although if his men could have located grain stores then their destruction could be seen to have caused starvation and ruin across Kill. Current archaeological evidence doesn't attest to any significant early medieval population centres within Kill and Butte other than at King Garth, which would have acted as a target. The outcome of this strategy doesn't seem to offer much value for Donald Breck when weighed against the cost and difficulty of mounting a winter campaign, suggesting that this is less likely to be a cause for the battle. According to the dates in the Dalriadan king lists, Donald Breck had been deposed as the king of the Corcureti by Fercar of Kennel Cowell in 637, in the aftermath of Donald Breck's catastrophic defeat at the Battle of Magroth in Ireland. The loss of prestige, together with the men he lost on the battlefield, must have seriously weakened Donald Breck's position, to the extent that his dynastic rival in Cowell made his move and seized power. The Battle of Glenmuirson can be explained as Donald Breck rallying his forces and riding out to force the issue, and win back his power over the Corcoretti with only a few months of his return from Ireland. Under these circumstances, it makes sense that the Battle of Glenmuirson took place in Cowell, and that it is there that we must look for the battlefield. Had Donald Breck's defeat at Moorison taken place within his own heartlands of Kintyre, at the hands of an invading host from Kenokau bent on not only seizing control of the Corcoretti but also on removing their dynastic rival, then it is tempting to think that Donald Breck's defeat would have left him with few places to retreat to and would likely have resulted in his death. As he lived on to fight another day, circumstances point to him being able to withdraw back to his own lands from the battlefield therefore leaving Cowell as the preferred location for the battle. There is precedent for a battle of control between the kings of Cowell and Kintyre for dominance over the Corcoretti. It is likely that after King Aidan's death in 609 that Conrad Kerr became the king in Cowell and Eochaid became king in Kintyre. Some arrangement may have existed between them but this broke down and resulted in the Battle of Fidnach in 617 from which Conrad Kerr emerged as the high king of the Corcoretti, though Eochaid lived on. Twenty years later, Donald Breck's disastrous defeat in the Battle of Magroth over in Ireland seems to have triggered a similar struggle between the kennels of the Corcoretti over who was best to rule as the High King. The Battle of Glenmuirson can arguably then be best explained not as a raid, but as a bid by Donald Breck to resolve a dynastic struggle within the Corcoretti, using military might in an attempt to restore his position as King and put down his usurper in Kennel Cow.
So, if the evidence of Donald Breck's battle at Glenmorison points to it being fought in Cowl against his dynastic rivals from Kennel Cowl, our next question is can we identify where the battle might have been fought? There is no current day valley named Glenmorison. Modern historians such as Tim Clarkson say Glenmorison defies identification. But in this video, I put forward the argument that there are two possible locations for Glen Morrison and Cowell. As language evolves, so place names change through common usage over time, sometimes becoming unrecognisable as they pass from one language to another. A nearby example of this is Dumbarton, which in the 7th century would be known to Donald Breck and his contemporaries as Alt Clute. As the language of the people of the area changed, so did the name, hence Alt Clute became Dumbarton and ultimately Dumbarton. Another source of confusion stems from the writing down of Gallic place names. When English-speaking cartographers came to map the Highlands, they pencilled in the Gallic names to the land as the locals told them. Gallic, however, was always an oral tongue and not a written language, therefore there was no universally agreed spellings for many words. As they were transcribed and reshaped by the English tongue, place names changed as they crossed from the oral record of the community to the written record of the cartographer. It is through this lens that we must peer and search for Glen Morrison. In his search for the battle site, the great Victorian historian William Skeen suggested that in the winter of 638, Donald Breck was fighting at the Muirston Water, a stream off the River Almond in West Lothian. Local legend places a battle there amongst four ancient burial mounds. He took this and linked the battle to the Dalriadans trying to defend their interests by fighting to delay the Anglian territorial expansion an East versus West situation, pitting the Dalriadans and the Britons against the Angles and the Picts. Modern scholarship has disproved this view, establishing Donald Breck as an ally of the Anglian kings, not an enemy. Up-to-date historical analysis means Muirston Water and Lothian must therefore be ruled out when searching for the battlefield. In Cowell, onomastically, Glen Masson seems at face value to offer the closest name fit for Glen Muirston. Taken in winter, this footage gives an idea of what Glen Masson may have been like for Donald Breck's men in January 638. But what would have brought Donald Breck's army down here? The Gallic place names of Nethercow are replete with references to horses. The wide valley which Glen Masson opens onto at its eastern end is called Strath Echig, or the Valley of the Horse River. Nearby is Inver Chapel, translating as the mouth of the river of the horses. It's possible that Donald Breck raided through Glen Masson to steal horses a valuable asset in early medieval society. On Scorach Moor, the pyramidal summit overlooking the convergence of Glen Tarson and Glen Masson, historians David Dorn and Nina Henry identified a potential standing stone on the summit, linking it to the Drumna Alban and suggesting it as a beacon hill. Observers stationed here would have had a clear line of sight to another beacon hill, Ben Lomond to the east, along with the capital of Altclut, Dumbarton Rock itself. When danger arose, they could light their beacon and alert the wider kingdom of any attack on the frontier. With clear weather, sentries posted here would have seen Donald Breck's army entering Glen Masson from its western end and they could have lit their beacon to warn Bretonic forces in the valley below and across the wider kingdom of Elkloot. Now, This wouldn't have been great for Donald Breck to infiltrate an army past it down Glen Masson, though perhaps he gambled that the winter weather would have brought the watchers down from their hills. If the Drumnalbin and the frontier of the Gales and the Britons did run through Cowell, then a raid by Donald Breck through Glen Masson would represent a cross-border incursion, which escalates his attack beyond just dynastic squabbling between the Corcoretti. As already discussed in our analysis of the causes of the battle, raiding seems to have been fairly common as a form of warfare in the early medieval period, and it may be that the cross-border plundering of resources between rivals was just an accepted norm. Additionally, if the Allied power blocks of Northern Britain existed as James Fraser suggests, then Donald Breck's attack in the West against Kennel Cow, the Outclute Britons or both, would have supported the Anglian invasion of Godothan in the East, which was going on at this time. In his studies of early medieval Northern Britain, the historian Leslie Alcock points to the value of General Roy's maps made in the 1740s and the 1750s. Coloured to indicate areas of cultivation or pasture, these provide a record of what land use was like before it was improved in the years since. This gives historians a window into what land use may have been like in Northern Britain decades and even centuries before General Roy's survey. 
Studying these maps for Nether Cowl, we can see that Glenda Rule, Ardine, the Danoon Sandbank Apron, and Strathecig are all shown as under cultivation, but none of Glen Masson is. If the battle was fought in Glen Masson, this detail implies that Donald Brick's army were using it as a routeway rather than plundering it for its resources. General Roy's map also shows Glen Masson funneling up into a bewildering array of quarries and glens. It looks easy for an army to get lost in, but not to provide an obvious entry or egress from a raid on the other cow. It does have clear spaces on which a battle could have been fought, however, had they been in there. If the battlefield site is to be located in Glenmasson, then it would seem to represent a cross-border attack of Domhnall Breck attempting to sneak in to Bretonic lands through the mazy glens of Central Cow and giving battle in order to disrupt the alliance of Kennel Cow with the Alclute Britons to divert them from their expansion of his Anglian allies in the east. Alternatively, Domhnall Breck may have led a host raiding into the fertile lands of Nether Kill to seize horses and cattle and he was caught and brought to bear in a battle on his way to escaping out into the hills. In either scenario, if the Drumna Alban, the frontier between Cowl and Alcloot ran through Cowl, then Glen Masson is in Britonic land and a battle here would have been fought against the Alcloot Britons rather than the Gales of Kennel Cowl. As the historian James Fraser argues, in the aftermath of his losses from the catastrophic Battle of Mag Roth in Ireland the previous summer, it is unlikely that Donald Breck would have risked such an attack against an enemy as powerful as Alcloot at this time. Therefore, Glen Masson seems less likely to be the site of Donald Breck's battle in 638. A second possible location for the Battle in Cowl can be found in one of the oldest surviving maps of Cowl. Near Glen Branta, as shown on plate 14 of Pont's map, drawn in the 1580s, lies Glen Murchin. Onomastically, Murchin is not too far removed from Murison, and it's not beyond doubt to argue that the 900 years between Irish chroniclers and Pont's mapmakers may have seen the name evolve over time. Analysis in the modern map shows that Glen Murchin's name was lost over time, being replaced at some point in the last 400 years by Strathnan Lub, now on the route for the Cow Way. Strathnan Lub is the Gaelic for the wide valley of the curve, which it is. Now, Strathnan Lub offers one of four ways into Nether Cowl for a force riding in from Kintyre via Shakur. It is possible that the territorial border at the edge of Dalriadan lands, the Drumna Alban, ran through Cowl, marking the frontier between the Kennel Cowl and the lands of the Alcloot Britons. If Donald Breck was seeking to avoid provoking direct conflict with the Britons, then his routes into Cowl were reduced to two main options, of which Glen Murchin was one. The route passes right in front of a hill called Sron Creekia, or the Nose of the Boundary. Had Donald Breck taken this route, he might have been riding into Cowl just inside the Dalriadan frontier with the lands of the Alcloot Britons. I'm following the Cowl Way as I'm exploring into Strathnan Love here. This is a great track that's been laid across the Cowl Peninsula from the west of it, in Portavari Way, on the fine side, out as far east now, I think, as um, the western shores of Loch Lomond, just below the Sloy Dam. That utilises a lot of kind of forest cushion tracks and, to some extent, some of the old drover paths as well. It was built on what would have been the ancient routeways across the peninsula. But now you can see, where we come away from the main roads and arteries of modern cow. It's how quiet it is. Look around. Just me. The landscape for you is stunning. Obviously there's danger of a good bit of Scottish weather coming. But it's wonderful. Especially this year of all years to actually get out. Strathnan Lub. It's the wide valley of the gentle curve. You can see the modern trail that's been cut into the hillside in front. The valley itself follows the winding bend of the main stream through this valley. You can see before the forestry plantation took over the land here, it would have presented a wide, open and fairly, fairly level space for a battle to take place. And you can see there's some good Scottish weather closing in on us today. And this is, allegedly, the height of a Scottish summer. I can imagine what it'd been like for Donald Brett coming through here near the Callans of January. Potentially there would have been snow, at the very least it would have been wet. 
bitingly cold, windy, driving icy rain into the face of his men. Hands would be numb, weapons would have felt heavy. And then to meet an enemy army on their path. I mean, quite the grim, grim battle. So of the two places, Strathan Lob is my preferred option for the battle by Moorison to have taken place. And why is that? In the early medieval period, it seems that Cow was split longitudinally from north to south amongst two different kingdoms. The evidence of place names dotted down the, the ridge line just to the west of Loch Eck and then cutting northeast out towards Loch Oilhead include a lot of the word, or well, the Gaelic word, Kikia, which means boundary. It's also a hill called Holiacan and Goyal, which means the uh, summit of the foreigners. Now to the east of this boundary, you can still find place names. For instance, Pole Farm in Mount Gullhead, or Gearletter, or between Ardentini and Strone. These have old Welsh Platonic roots. And I suggest, and this theory is supported by the late Elizabeth Rennie, David Doran, academics such as Tim Clarkson and James Fraser, these place names represent that part of Cow, at one point being part of the Kingdom of Alclute, or Dumbarton, Dumbarton Rock, the Kingdom of South Clyde that later became after the Vikings sacked it. Now, if the eastern part of Cow represents Bretonic territory, won by the King of Alclute, then for Donald Breck to come down east of that line represents another invasion of a different kingdom. Is that a fight he wants to pick? If his fight is indeed with Kennel Cow, then it makes sense he stays within Kennel Cow territory and Kennel Cow lands. And to come south through Cow on a raiding mission or to attack, to crush a dynastic foe, then it makes sense he comes down through Strathnan Lub, through here, rather than the other option, Glen Masson. The Strathnan Lub on Pont's map from the 16th century was called Glen Murchin. And that's why I argue that Glen Murchin could over time have transfigured to Glen de Murison, as noted in the 7th century record of Donald Brecht's battle. Now I've just reached the proper kind of valley floor of the Strath and you can see if I pan around it's how flat it is. There's a marked difference in the gradient as I've climbed up from Glen Rule, where the Strath kind of floors out up to the floor of the Strath here between the surrounding ridges. You can see the gradient of the hills on either side is quite shallow as well. This is quite an easy going flat space. In terms of a place to have a conflict, this seems like a fair, a fair option. Obviously, this ground has been improved for a plantation, a forestry trail run through it. It may be that it is quite marshy, perhaps too marshy, to want to fight a battle on. Walking further up the glen, I'm really struck by how sheltered it is. On the drive here today, you can see by the clouds up behind me, the weather was pretty bad. But up here, it's almost as if I'm in a lull. So I wonder if this protected Breck's men when they came here in the middle of winter. Obviously, not as nice. But yeah, it's, it's calm. Nice. And you can see, the further up the glen I go, you can see behind me, it's just flat. Surprisingly, surprisingly flat. Obviously covered by quite a lot of forestry commission stuff nowadays. But, quite a flat space. Easy going. Offers an easy route into Cow. And it does offer quite a useful place and a possible place to stage a battle. So here I am, right in the middle of Strathnan Lab. Over there, that ridge line up there is Cow Glen. This is the head of Glen de Rule that we started this walk at. Behind me, up here, 
is Glen Branter. That's where this valley eventually comes out, uh, which leads down into Shakur and then onto the shores of Loch Fyne, which would have been on the boundaries of Donald Brest's Kintyre territory in the 7th century. Behind me, on this misty hillside up here, is Bielach Nan Sack. Uh, Bielach is pass in Gaelic. So that means we've got a pass here between Strathan Lub and the next valley over this ridgeway. Now that next valley, interestingly, is Gracha Glen, which leads down into the head of Glen Masson. So, um, centuries ago, the drovers used to take their cattle across into that glen and round the north side of Ben Moor through the gap called Bernus, and then they would swim them across Loch Hick on their way out eventually to the cattle markets uh, towards Glasgow. So this shows that we're in the heart, really, of ancient trackways that would have crisscrossed across Cowl. This is a crossroads, if anything. And you also see, hopefully, round about me in the terrain, just behind me, it's really flat. For quite some distance behind me, and from where I've come, back this way, the gradient is very, very slight. So in terms of a trackway or routeway that penetrates quite deep into Cowl, this is perfect. It's an excellent way in. And as I said earlier on, it's sheltered. I've not been exposed to the weather at all really today. So yeah, it seems like it potentially is the way that Donald Bright came in. So Strathnan Lub is Glen Murkin. How did that come about? Pontru's map of Cowl in the late 16th century, in the 1580s into the 1590s. At that time, Gaelic is by no means a, a written language with a standard spelling. It's more an oral tongue. So what happens is that a lot of the spellings that we see on maps of the Gaelic place names at this period will change and the spelling morphs over time. So we come down to the modern era, something that's written on Pont's map in the 16th century may be spelt quite differently. It may even be renamed, in fact between then and now, as happened with this place. So Strathnan Lub is a very certain, I guess, place name based on what the glen looks like. It is a long, broad curve, and it is a quite flat, wide open glen. In the late 16th century, Glen Murchin, which means the place of the sea dogs, now the Arden Murchin Peninsula further north means a high place of sea dogs, and people have linked that back to Obviously, like in a high rocky peninsula that would have had seals um, living on the coastline around about it. Perhaps this glen had otters in the waterfalls and the stream that kind of runs through it. Or perhaps Murkin is an echo of Murkin or Murison from the battle site that Donald Breck fought in in the 7th century AD. The Gaelic language is a thing that morphs over time, especially when English cartographers come to the Highlands to write down Gaelic place names. The spellings often change. And it possibly is that. An old, old name written down by an Englishman listening to a Gaelic speaker. And then over the centuries, since Pont's map in the 1580s, 1590s, that name has been lost and it's changed completely into Stratham and Love. For the first possible location of the battle in Glen Masson, I argued that Donald Breck may have been fighting there as part of a cross-border raid or attack to disrupt the Alcloot Britons and assist his Anglian allies in Northumbria as part of a wider political picture in mid-7th century Northern Britain. What then could be the reasons for a battle in Glen Murchin or Strathnan Lub, as it's now known? One reason certainly is that Glen Morrison offers a direct route for raiders into one of the most agriculturally productive areas of Cowell. This is where the heights of Strathnan Lub come down towards the green valley of Glendaruel, just in front here. This is the head of Glendaruel. See there's lots of old deciduous forest here. And Glendaruel is quite a fertile space. It would have been farmed in the early medieval period. In one of the rare spaces in Argyll that would have afforded that. Be a rich ground for plunder for Donald Breck as he's coming in to Cowl. 
A further supporting factor behind Glen Morrison being the site of the battle is that it offers a route into the very heart of the ancient Kennel Cow. If Donald Breck had been leading an army to face down his dynastic rival, it's a logical step to argue that he was headed for the power centre of Kennel Cow in Southern Butte. Historians James Fraser and Lloyd Lang argue that the political seat of Kennel Cow was a hill fort of Donegoyle in the adjacent monastic centre of Kingarth, near the southern tip of Butte. To launch an attack there without using a fleet to reach the island, Donald Breck had only one option, to make a crossing by the narrows at Colin Tribe. Colin Tribe is Gaelic for the narrows of the swimming, and was historically a place where drovers swam their cattle from Butte to the mainland. This offers the tantalising possibility that Donald Breck could have planned to have his cavalry force swim the narrows and strike at the heart of his enemies. Early medieval warriors in northern Britain wore little armour, so it's not beyond reason that the warriors of Kintyre expected to be able to swim across the Colin Tribe narrows alongside their ponies. Had Donald Breck been able to carry off such a bold move without his enemies being forewarned, then the potential rewards would have been great. A mounted force could have reached Donegoyle and King Garth from their crossing in less than half a day's ride. His enemies would not have had enough time to raise an army, and the Cow King Ferker may have only had his household guard for defence. The Kintyre army would have ridden over them and crushed the usurpers with ease. The timing of the battle in mid-January 638 supports this scenario. A surprise attack carried out in the depths of winter when usually a lord would have disbanded his forces and sent them back to their homes until the next campaigning season in the spring. In theory, it seems to offer Donald Breck, with his forces presumably still depleted from his defeat the previous summer in Ireland, the best chance of regaining control over the Corcureti and removing his usurper. However, weighed against this, it would have required Domhnall Breck's army to move at considerable speed, both through his lands of Kintyre and through the glens of Cow in order to avoid detection. The Picts and Scots were keen guerrilla fighters and often relied upon his speed and the element of surprise when attacking, but it would have been all too easy for Kennel Cowell's spies to pass on word of Domhnall Breck's plans to their masters back home. Perhaps that is indeed what happened, allowing a Kennel Cow army to be gathered waiting for Domhnall Breck as he rode through Glen Morrison, turning a raid into a pitched battle. A further problem for this plant is the weather. The Irish chroniclers recorded the battle as occurring in January 638. This would require Donald Breck's army to ride for days from his stronghold of Dunaverty at the southern tip of Kintyre. If his forces have mixed composition and included infantry, he may have been slowed enough to have been on the road for eight days before the battle. Early Scots soldiers were each required to carry a bag of oatmeal for the provisions on campaign, which they fried in fat or animal blood before eating. In a sodden Scots winter, fuel for fires would have been hard to come by. It's questionable if these men would have been in fighting condition by the time they reached the target. In spite of this, the evidence shows that Donald Breck's army were capable of such a march. Five years after the Battle of Glen Morrison, Donald Breck led a similar mid-January march as far afield as Strathcarran before fighting the army of the Alcloot Britons. The proposed crossing at Colin Tribe poses a similar question. In January, the waters would have been bone-numbingly cold for men and horses. Perhaps worse still would have been the following ride in sodden wet clothes in the teeth of a biting icy wind. Perhaps Donald Breck planned for his men to dry off in the warm halls of his enemy, though, once he'd ridden in and captured Donegal. Admittedly, such a plan has many problems. However, Donald Breck's record of poor choices and ill-advised schemes throughout his reign implies that it is not impossible that an intercepted attack on the royal seat of Kennel Cow was the cause of the Battle of Glen Morrison. As a route through South Cowell and a location offering an appropriate field of battle away from Cowell's precious agricultural and pastoral land, Glen Merkin offers a strong candidate for being the lost Glen Morrison recorded more than a millennia ago.
To explore what the Battle of Glen Muirsom is like, we need to look beyond the rather sparse record of the event in the Irish Chronicles. It is often only the death of potentates that merit a mention in early medieval records of battles, so it's not unusual that we aren't given much detail for Muirsom. To understand what the battle may be like, we need to draw on the wider information available to us. One helpful document comes from the late 7th century, a few decades after the Battle of Glen Muirsom was fought. The Sensius Ferna Alban was a census of the wider Kingdom of Dalriada, evidence of a sophisticated kingdom recording and formalising its military strength. The census has the three principal kindreds of Dalriada being able to field an army totalling 2,000 men. By then, Kintyre, Arran and Carl had merged into Kel Gabran, and the census accounts for 800 fighting men being raised from across these areas, along with an obligation to provide 56 warships. In addition, 600 warriors were each also due from Kennel Lorne, along with 42 warships, and Kennel Angus on Isla, with 43 warships. The census stipulates only the rigid minimum though. A successful ruler may have attracted many more warriors to his army. Second sons, exiles and the dispossessed, for example, the Anglian princes Oswald and Oswiu, who fought for Dalriada whilst they were in exile, show that the rigid numbers of the Sentius Ferna Alban would likely have been augmented by those interested in adventure, plunder, or with an obligation to the king. Each house listed on the census had an obligation to provide men. Between them, 20 houses had to supply 30 men, which would have been enough to crew two warships. Depending on the number of houses in an area, the figures for Kennel Lorn give us five ranks of noble depending upon the number of men they brought to battle. Using an 18th century survey of Jacobean Scotland, the historian Leslie Alcock proposes that a maximum military force represents around 20% of the full population. Therefore, based on the numbers given by the census for Alban, he argues that wider Dalriada's population was about 10,000, with northern Britons being about 180 to 200,000 in the 7th century. Any major expedition of our period would have comprised of a mixed body of horse and foot soldiers, in varied proportions according to the kingdoms involved. The foot soldiers would have reduced the speed of movement to around 15 miles a day. Moreover, even a mounted force would have been hindered by two factors, the need for accompanying grooms and the need for pack horses if only to carry the hard grain which the steeds would require on the expedition. By modern roads, it's around 110 miles from the Kenelgabran stronghold of Dunaverty in Kintyre to the mouth of Glen Muirson. Had Donald Bright not risked his ships and possibly the element of surprise on a naval engagement or on the winter seas, then his forces would have needed eight days to make the battlefield through whatever the midwinter weather threw at them on the way. In the early medieval period, 300 men would have made an army. Judging by the muster rolls indicated in the census Ferna Alban, Donald Breck and Ferker may have fielded some 400 men or so on each side, depending upon the allies and the mercenaries to hand. Of the two valleys in consideration for the battle site, both offer stretches of open flat land that would have been suitable for a pitched battle. It is apparent, however, that Glen Marken, now Strathnan Lub, offers the more feasible terrain. In the biting January weather, the fighting would have been brutal. Accounts of early medieval battles, such as the Godothan poem, show that casualties for the losing side could be horrendous. Nobles and even kings could be expected to be in the thick of the fighting, as shown by the Battle of Fid Ewan in 631, in which Donald Breck's predecessor, King Conrad Kerr, fell in the fighting along with two unnamed princes of the Kenon of Gabran. At the Battle of Murison, it is likely that both Donald Breck and his likely rival Ferker fought on the field, and that both survived. After the armies clashed, it is likely that the victorious Kenokil forces would have pursued Donald Breck's defeated forces before returning to scour the battlefield for booty. Any abandoned baggage and pack animals would be seized, with any abandoned camp followers likely enslaved. The bodies of the vanquished dead would have been stripped for jewellery and weaponry, and possibly decapitated for trophies. Technically, all of the battlefield loot belonged to the Kenokil king Ferker, who would distribute the wealth amongst the survivors.
In summary, the evidence points to the Battle of Glen Morrison being fought within Cowell between the Kennel Gabran forces of Donald Brick and those of his dynastic rival Ferker and his Kennel Kill army. The timing of the battle is unusual and out of season, although not unique for Donald Brick as he would fight his next and final battle in winter again in December of 643. Although the battle could be a hosting or a cattle raid that was intercepted, it is more likely that Donald Brick had attacked to reassert his authority over his dynastic rival Ferker, striking in the winter in an attempt to catch his enemies off guard. Against the backdrop of the wider political events unfolding across northern Britain at the time, it is more than likely that Donald Brick's attack was intended to unbalance the Kennel Cow Alt Clute Britain alliance. This could either have been to divert their attention away from resisting Anglin expansion in the east, or it could have been a bid by Donald Brick to boost his bargaining power within the wider Iona, Kintyre and Anglian alliance. As a consequence of his defeat at Glen Morrison, Donald Brick would have been forced to accept the dominance of Ferker and Kennel Cowell as the king of the Corku Reti. This may have also reduced Kennel Gabran to a subordinate, vassal kingdom, reliant on the powerful Anglian king Oswald rather than fighting its own corner in northern Britain and fully controlling its own affairs. This would have been a remarkable decline in status for the Kennel Gabran after the heady days of Aidan MacGabran's rule at the turn of the 7th century. The Irish chronicles often record only the scantest details and we cannot know how many fell during the Battle of Glen Morrison. We do know that it was another five years before Donald Brecht fought again, so perhaps it can be argued that his losses forced him to rebuild for some time. The victorious King Ferker of Kenokal would rule the Corku Reti until his own death in 650. Domhnall Brick, last of the preeminent Kenogabran kings, was eventually killed by the Alt Britons at the Battle of Strathcarran in 643. Historian James Fraser argues that Domhnall Brick and the Kenogabran were brought down by a mixture of the might of Clyde Rock Britons together with a measure of Kenokal opportunism. In the face of the shifting balance of power in 7th century Northern Britain, the hapless Domhnall Brick fell foul of a new and powerful alliance that would stand firm until the next century. Domhnall Brick's final defeat and death is detailed in the Strathcarran stanza of the Godothan poem, as translated here. I saw an array that came from Kintyre, who brought themselves as a sacrifice to a holocaust. I saw a second array who had come down from their settlement, who had been roused by the grandson of Nathan. I saw mighty men who came with dawn, and it was Domhnall Brick's head that the ravens gnawed. If you made it this far, thanks for watching. The purpose of these videos is to explore the history of the area of Cal, really more of the kind of ancient stuff and the early medieval stuff, of which there's so much going on, but I have so little to find in kind of mass media. If you like what you saw and you want to see some more, please hit like and subscribe below. Thanks for watching.